minutes each time we ask that question. That's a good thing. We need to be reading our word, man. That's what it's all about. You know, the thing is, is you read these scriptures, you get, the Lord's going to speak to you in, in, in his way to you. You know, you're going to get your, your own, what he has to say to you. That's the amazing thing about the Holy Spirit, about God's word, man, that you can actually, you know, read a scripture that someone else is reading. And you guys, that's what the group times is about. All of a sudden, hey, I got this or I got that. Not meant to be debating one another. Some guys do that. But, you know, more, more or less to see how, how diverse the Holy Spirit is, how it speaks, how he speaks to all of our lives individually. That's what reading the Bible is all about. I think if it's anything, we all come to that agreement in here. Is that's, what we, that's why we read the word. It's because we need to hear from the Lord. Uh, we need direction in our lives, speaking to us individually about our lives. You know what I'm saying? If, it, if, it, if you don't have that established yet, that's something you got to work on, man, because God wants to speak to you about you. And, and he wants to tell you things about your life individually. And that's amazing as soon as you begin to establish that relationship with him. All of a sudden you have this walk, you know, that's directed by God. He says it. He says, you call, out, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things in which you do not know. Jeremiah 33, 3, man, it's an amazing scripture. So... <clears throat> Let's pray. We'll get in. We have communion tonight. <clears throat> it's going to be good. I always love communion. It's the night of cleansing. <laughs> you know, just receiving that. The reminder of being free from sin. That's, you count me in on that every time. I'm, I love being reminded that I'm free from my sin, from what my eyes caused me to sin from, my mind. It's just a good, good, amazing truth that we're forgiven of these things. But let's pray and we'll get into it. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, we do, many of us in here, want to ask that you would forgive us of our sin. Like your word says, if we hold iniquity in our hearts, you won't hear us. And, Lord, we don't, we don't even want to walk into your presence with that type of uh, uh, darkness on us. So we ask, Lord, that you would cleanse our minds, Lord, uh, of the day, of the things that the enemy has so tried to stick on our minds, whether it's family situations, or whether it's work, or whatever it might be, maybe it's nothing. <laughs> maybe we're here and we're ready to receive. And Lord, we thank you because you've given us the mindset to do that. You've set us free from sin. And Lord, now your, your next thing for all of us is that we would grow in you now. And so Lord, we pray that you would go before us in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So 1 Samuel chapter 17 is where we're at. We're reading up to verse 22, right? And I kind of wish we would have read more, but it's actually a good spot to stop. And um, as we, the, kind of just to, to get into it a little bit, we're, we're getting into a point now <clears throat> where we're going to see uh, David's anointing on his life uh, start to, God is going to set the stage for his anointing. God is going to set the stage for David's life. As God sets the stage oftentimes in the Bible for many people we read about. Uh, Noah had his stage set. You know, what was Noah's stage? He was building a big, you know, boat out in the, where it's never rained. His stage was set. That was his anointing stage, you know. Uh, and, and you see a lot of characters, a lot of people read about in the scripture. Their stages are set by God. And this is going to be an interesting stage set because the stage that we're going to see or the scene that we're going to see set by God for David is one that is similar to Jesus' stage. It's similar to our Savior's scene. And at the same time, that's where we stop ourselves and we say, in that like manner, it's the scene for all of us. It's a, it's a very similar scene that we all have. And so because you've got to ask yourself, what is God going to do to take this young man and put him in his, in, in his place? I mean, that's the question we ask ourselves today. That's the question you and I probably pray to God all the time. Lord, what next for my life? What do you have in store for me now, Lord? I, I feel like, I think every man in this room feels that they can uh, confidently say, you have received the Holy Spirit. I think every man in this room can say you have received Jesus Christ in your heart. Uh, you know, for the most part, I think most of you guys can say that. Uh, if not, you have an opportunity to do that later on. As this church and Pastor Jeff is faithful in doing that all the time, 
you know, to, to give the message of, of salvation out. So a lot of us are there. We're at that point where we're kind of like, all right, Lord, I, I feel like I got a relationship with you, but what is my stage? What is the scene going to look like for me? What is this, this transition going to be like? Some of us are in that transition now. Uh, some of you are in that transition and don't really know it because it's hard sometimes to identify that this can actually be a scene for you created by God. And that's what we're going to see when we look at David tonight. And that's what we're going to see when you look at Jesus as a whole. This is actually, just cheating ahead a little bit, is the conflict that exists with the Jews today. Is they didn't like the scene that was set for Jesus. Just as much as Pastor Jeff was talking last night. They want King David, right? He talked about the Israel, uh, Israelis today. They want to talk about King David, but they don't want to talk about when he uh, slept with Bathsheba. You know, so it's like... They, the same with Jesus. They, they didn't want their savior scene or sort of stage to be one that incorporated a cross. It was too whatever for them. It was like, that's not our savior. What are you kidding me? My king didn't. Uh, uh, cursed is a man who hangs on a tree, as a matter of fact. You know, and they took that and, and just said, that's not our savior. So understanding the stage that is set in your life. We find by understanding the stages that are set in all these examples to the scripture. And David has the anointing. And now we're looking for what God is going to do next to draw him closer into the palace or into the monarch and further from the sheepfold. <laughs> what's, what, what's God going to do to make that happen? How do you, how do you take a, a, a shepherd, this sheep herder, how do you take this nothing and turn him into a king? You know, at our last men's events, the title of it was From the Caves to the Throne, and it was of David. And we watched how God had him in the caves, hiding in there, and all these things, and the things that took place with him in the cave, and how God used that to, to bring him into the throne, the reigning over Israel. See, the sad part about that is today, not too many people believe this anymore. People don't really believe that God can still do this with somebody, that God can actually take a sheep boy. A nothing and turn him into a something and turn him into a king, in fact, just by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how often I've heard <clears throat> that there's no way, you know, uh, that some God could just take some old nothing. Well, what would you do before you were a pastor? Oh, I don't know. You know and, and, and you hear these things today because today's day and age is so stuck on the outward and they're so stuck on what we think should be what should be in a person you know a pastor has to be one who has gone to seminary brother in my opinion and you know knows the scripture up and down that's how i'm going to receive and only receive from him too you know i want a, a, a scholar of our day uh sorry man i was a janitor oh <laughs> you ain't got nothing to say to me then brother you know god can, can't take somebody and turn them into something can't can you see the scripture teaches us that that's that's the truths of the bible and so as long as we focus on those truths of the scripture, we have hope that God can take us from right where we're at and use us in a way that we have never thought before. He can do it. If you doubt that in this room tonight, then you're going to see a sheep boy on his process and road to turning into the king of Israel and the stage, what it looks like for him. And you're going to see it in your life, too. As you trust in the Lord and you take these, these attributes and characteristics that we read from, like David, and we say, man, so this is the kind of person God wants me to be right now then. You mean I don't have to go chase after, you know, the gold medal? I don't have to go chase after, you know, the, the and again, nothing wrong with education, but I, and I mean that. But you don't have to chase after these things in order to think that God needs you to do that in order for him to use you. It's a lie straight from Satan. We, we, we read it when Samuel was making the decision to elect the new uh, king out of Jesse's sons. Who did he go for? The wrong guys. Because he was going on the outward. God stopped him in his tracks and says, listen, man. It's, I don't look at the outward. Don't you get it? I look at the inward. And we're going to see some of that inward in David. We're going to see what, God, what, God, what attributes God was really wanting to pull out of David that we would learn from. But let's see first, though. The beginning here stages for David, and it starts 17 verse 1. 
And he says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shiko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shogo and Azekah in Ephes And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. There they are. And in verse 3, the Philistines stood on one mountain and on the one side, and the Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. So the stage is set. Okay, this is the scene. The scene are, is an army, is a battle scene. It's a scene where now you have Israel on this side and the Philistines on this side, and, and it's going to be an all-out war. Blood and guts. Okay, because that's how they got down back then. Literally. Blood and guts. And they're standing, and this is one of those things where it, it's, it's, it's enemy against Israel. It's God's chosen people against God's uh, sort of ordained enemy. Okay, this is the stage. And this is the stage that we so often see in our lives too. But we don't always recognize it as God's setting stage. God's building stage. You see, his, what he's doing here is, remember, he's going to get ready to bring in the victor. The one who's going to uh, have a victory on behalf of the whole army pretty soon here. David's victory was won by himself. But yet it was won that transferred into others too. And this is the scene beforehand. A scene of war. A scene of fear. See... But it doesn't so often in our minds connect that way, does it? The scene that God is setting in every one of our lives as he's anointed us and has drawn us to, to a calling that he's given us is going to be one that is set in a similar pattern of war. And that's why Paul is so big on that. That's why Paul teaches on spiritual warfare. He's like, come on, don't you get it? Your flesh is going to be waging war against the spirit that's what's in you. It's going to be a not an ongoing battle all the time. Do not see that. Don't you get it? You see, when God's calling you and he's going to move in your life, you better get ready to get down. Because this walk, this road, this new path, this anointing that you have is going to come with you having to die to yourself. It's going to be you crucifying your flesh all the time. It's going to be you getting ready. It, it's not going to be you just, oh, oh. You know, and harps playing, and cupids everywhere. This is this is God saying, "Be ready, because in these days, as I've anointed and I've called you, the scene that I'm setting for David is the same scene that I set for my son when I sent him down there. He didn't come to; he came to die on a cross. That's the pattern here that we're seeing develop through the Scripture, and if it's the pattern that we see in David, a pattern that we see in the Son of God, then you better believe it's going to be something we're going to find in our own lives. We're not exempt from that. I hope we don't believe that. If we're looking for the easy way out, then you're looking for the wrong road. God has called you to a, a path that involves warfare. A scene and a stage that is going to get dirty. It's going to get bloody, man. And, and it's going to get bloody personally. Yeah, I'm not saying for all this stuff, go run out the street and start killing all these heathens. It's going to get bloody spiritually. You know, we're going to, we're going to be fighting it within ourselves where you almost feel like you're, you're tormenting yourself, man. How many of you guys have felt like the way? Sometimes that you're sitting there dealing with these spiritual things you're going through and you're just flipping out. And you're like, what's going on here, man? Why am I, why is this such a tug of war? Why, why is, why, just because I want to go either do something right or I want to quit whatever you want to quit or I want to change whatever you want to change. It's such a battle to do that. And the sad part about it is us as men, instead of fighting to the end until we see that enemy dead, we justify it and we give up and we say, that is just me. But you won't find that here in our scene tonight. You're not going to find that in the scene with David. You fight that enemy until you cut his head off. You see, but a lot of us here, we just, well, I get it. There's a war. That's my church thing. But when I go out and do my thing, that's the world thing. And that's who I am out in the world. No, you are who you are here as you are out there. And this is who God wants you to be the whole way through. So he sets the scene for you. Get ready for warfare. If you, can, if, you, if you can come 
If you could come to Christ right now, as, as most of us have, and you say, Jesus, I'm all yours. And he says, he's going to get ready for war. Then you say, okay, Lord. Then you give me the strength. Or do you say by your action, yeah, I'm good with war, you know, at some points, maybe in some conversations. But if it, it really starts to inflict my life personally, like if it makes me tired, if I got to stay up an extra hour late, or if I start getting, you know, zits or whatever over it, I don't want it. But, but you say, no, man, this is all the way. This is your whole life. So the scene is set for David. But we don't know. But David, young David, is not here yet. But we're seeing the picture that God is drawing here. And he says in verse 4. Now, let's see the second addition to this, this uh, stage. And there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath, Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Most of us know that to be nine feet. And as a matter of fact, nine feet is huge, dude. Because I went online and I looked up the world's tallest man, and it's this kind of foreigner, I don't know what he was, but he was 8'3. And he sits on like a big old couch, like he's just kind of coast, like I'm on this stool. <laughs> you know what I mean? This dude is huge. But he has to walk with these things with his legs because he's so tall. And it's like he can't, his bones are all weirded out from it, I guess. But the dude slouches down and normal buildings and everything. You know, and he's just kind of like a freak because everybody takes pictures next to him and they want to go by the tall guy and everything. But this dude is huge, 8'3". And me, I could imagine what that's like. And Danny was over making fun of me earlier, saying, oh, man, you're short. It must be messed up for you around tall people. I'm like, yeah, yeah okay, thanks, man. So, but 8'3", eight, eight, this guy was. But Goliath was supposed to be 9 feet. If you have your chance, go type up the, you know, the world's tallest guy and you'll see how tall this dude is. And then picture a nine-foot soldier. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This guy that's 8'3", he's real skinny. Like I said, he's on these things that he has to walk with. But Goliath was nine-foot killing machine. And you're like, talk about a good presentation here, God. You know, <laughs> the Lord's setting a pretty good scene here, isn't he? And he's going to use a choice select picture of what an enemy really looks like. Nine-foot tall soldier. And so here's Goliath, and he, and he says in verse 5, And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and, he, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. So this is a monstrous guy. This guy was born to kill people. Okay? And anybody who was to get in his way, he would kill them. He would, I picture this dude biting heads off. Okay? And taking his weaver's beam and, and toothpicking dudes with it. Okay? The, can you imagine the Philistine army when they had these brothers? Because there was quite a bit of them. There was more of them. But can you imagine these guys, you having them as soldiers? I mean, you're talking, you're talking, and especially at a time where this actually mattered. Today, you shoot him, boom, he's done. Nine foot, whatever, 15 feet, you're done. I'll shoot you in the head. Back then, it was a little different. Okay, back then, it was like, you're a big dude. You're going to be a hard one to take down because I only got a sword and you got his. Well, you know, when you think about that, a little off topic, David actually kind of, he went using the sling and everything, kind of took that philosophy of a gun, you know, and just said, just shoot the guy. You know, but anyway, that's for another story. But <laughs> the image here is the point that I'm making. God is allowing for this scene to look this way. He said, here's war. This is all, though. Keep, we have to keep it in the back of our minds that this is the stage being set for the anointed, right? But we have to see it as God is allowing for number one, the first part of the scene to be a war scene, letting us know what we're to be prepared for. The second thing is we see this image, man, this image that would instill fear in everyone, this enemy that is unstoppable. There's no way we can get past it. There is absolutely no way I would get past a nine foot soldier like this. Okay, there's no physical way. And we know when the spies went and they viewed the land, you guys remember Joshua? They saw the giants. But what did they say when they see them? Well, 
We're like grasshoppers. Look at these grapes, the grapes the size of our head. They eat, they pop these things up and eat them. And we're gonna go fight these guys? See, <clears throat> the enemy makes it a real good point for every person who has been anointed by God, who has been filled with the Holy Spirit, who has a calling on their life, he makes it a point to confront them with an enemy that looks like they will never be able to get past ever. What is that enemy for you? See, a lot of us have these things in our lives. We have these, these objects that we just have settled to say it's just a part of me because I can't beat it. What is that for you? Well, in fact, let me rephrase that. What has God revealed to you that that is to you? Because I'm sure God has revealed it to you already. You have an enemy. You have a Goliath in your life somewhere. As they did when they went into Jericho. It's always when they're going to enter into the promises that God has for them. When they're confronted with this unstoppable enemy. What's yours? What is it? How many times have you gone forward and you were moving with the Lord and God was moving in your life and he put a calling on you. He's giving you gifts. I talk about that all the time. And you're going, man, and you're excited. And then something always just stops you from going. You're gone a few weeks, a few months later, you come back and say, oh, I just went on a little run, you know. What is that enemy that gets you every time? For them, at this point, up, not, not yet, but for the most part, to this point, it's been these giants. It's been the, the, the appearance of these guys. It's been these yoked up killing machines. But those things have forms today. They have their different forms. For some people, a giant really is, on, is finances. Some people, it's drugs. Some people, it's women. For some guys, man, it's, it's, it's just anger. I just get fired up, man. It's, for some guys, it's their attitude, whatever, you know, you're prideful, whatever, you don't even know. But God's speaking to you in the back of your head, and you're like, oh. It's different for every single one of us. But it's the same. The enemy uses them to do the same thing, and that's to try to make the appearance to instill not just fear, but the thought that you can't go forward anymore. That's the failure. That's the mystery. That's the trick behind it all. I know so many, and many of you in here know them too. And some of you, we know the same people who, who have been stopped. And you get so bummed out, man. And, and, and you just go, what stopped you this time? And if you really look into it, you know, you do kind of a little psychoanalyst on, uh, analyzation on some of these things, you find that the substance of these things was the same. It, was, it, it wasn't drugs. It was, it, was, it was fear. It wasn't, you know, love. It was anger. You know, you, you see the substance is usually the same. And you say, come on, man. You want to go to that brother, you know, and say, come on, don't you see? It's just the enemy. He's just putting a giant up in front of you, man. You know, see it, recognize it. Let this be the night. And these are the messages we take as Bible students, and we highlight them, and we go, and we see someone going through and say, don't let this giant stop you, brother. It's just another giant. God's allowing for this scene to be set. But look at now. We have the image. Look at verse 8. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel. So now this thing speaks. <laughs> All right, this thing don't just stand there like a big old beast. He actually says something. And he says, And he cried unto the armies of Israel and said to them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that will that may fight together. And Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines. And they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, if this Philistine was to come in this room and call one of us out, I'm pretty sure we would be afraid. And I'm pretty sure, you know, we we probably I, we, I don't know who would be the first one to go at it. But here's the thing: a lot of the times, I heard this really cool message, man. I never forget it, by this guy, Marvin, Marvin Wine. <clears throat> and he talked about Satan, okay? And, and he, he kind of gave this little thing about, with Satan, about how some people just like, hey, Satan, you know, you walk into the room, somebody tell the devil I'm here, you know, I've got no problem with Satan. I'll take Satan out, I don't got no problem with Satan. And the thing is, is when we start to really think about that, we're not, if, if Satan was to confront you, okay, 
right now. Well, say when you leave and you get in your car and he's sitting in the passenger seat. Actually, a matter of fact, if that's Satan, let me rephrase that. And she's sitting in the passenger seat. Okay? Because that's exactly how he come at you. See, because we, we like to think of Satan maybe as he's, I'll take this dude out, man. Like Pastor Glenn has this poster of Satan all yoked up and he's arm wrestling Jesus. I'm like, eh, my Satan looks a lot different than that, okay? <laughs> my Satan is a little more persuasive and influential to me. And I know you guys know what I'm talking about. Because Satan's going to come at you not in the form of a giant. Maybe for some, maybe some of you are afraid of big dudes, you know. But for the most part, he's going to come at you at your weakest, most that image, and I'm not going to try to put images in your head right now, but those things that make you go, oh, no, man, I don't even want to smell that. You know what I'm saying? I don't even, I don't want to think about that time because I remember the fill of the room. I remember, you know, my mind goes there. I hate it. But that's how Satan comes at us. He comes at us in this way, and then he starts to talk. And he starts to talk, and he says, hey, why don't you come on and fight me? Oh, come on. He doesn't say, Satan doesn't go, ooh, scare you away. Ah, you run. No, he says, hey, come, come over here. Come over here for a second. I want to talk to you. She says, come over here. <laughs> Let's talk about something. You know, he, he wants you to, to come close. He wants you to, 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 he wants to talk with you. It's like that. I always forget that general's name. Uh, what is it? Is it Asian? Japanese general? Old Japanese general? Really used a lot of his quotes. Anyway, talks about how the deception of the enemy is to convince the the, the offense that the enemy is is actually you know far but really standing right right on the side of him and that's Satan. See, he he wants to be next to you. He wants to be or he wants you to come close to him. And this is what Goliath is doing. He's his by his words. Not only by his appearance is he standing and freaking him out, but now he's saying, "Come on, bring it on. Somebody come down, come down to me." And as soon as Satan decides to call one of you guys out, do me a favor, don't go down. <laughs> this is the thing. You see, we're going to learn here later. I don't want to cheat too much. This victory was paid by one person, as our victory was paid by one person also. You see, this victory is not meant to be yours. This victory that we stand up against this giant has been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ already. And many of us fail in that because we think that it's our duty to take on this war. It's our duty to take on this enemy. I'm talking up here a lot about, come on, guys, you guys got an enemy, you got a giant, you got to fight it. Listen, Jesus came and he fought it for you already. That's why he said, you're more than a conqueror. You're more than victorious now. Because he came and he paid the price for every single one of us. And that enemy, or whatever she looked like, or whatever he looked like, or whatever it looks like, Jesus came and he already killed it for you. You got to find your strength in him, you see, not, not in you. But the enemy draws you, isn't it? He wants you to get your mind out, outside of, of what our victor, who our victor is, and put it on the whole situation and the whole scene. And this is what Goliath's trying to do. He knows they're afraid of him. This dude's huge. He probably did this all the time. You guys see that movie, Troy? It's like that one big dude at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That Troy goes and does his neck. Yeah. It's like that's what the other army did all the time. They, they use the big dude to go win the wars and all this stuff. And, and this is what they were using Goliath for. They came to try to do this. And it was working up to this point. Because those are the tactics of the enemy. And these are God-ordained situations. I keep saying that because we have to remember this scene is created by God. He allows for these things to take place in our lives. He allows, he'll let the enemy, he, he, you see it happen all the time. A lot of us go, oh man, I thought I became a Christian. Why am I struggling with this still? No, God. Hey, this is, hey, welcome to life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Welcome to the world. We're still stuck here in this world, aren't we? And the enemy is all around us. The scene is set before us every day. And so the enemy drawing us out, drawing a lot of Christians towards him as he calls them out. And they get in there and they try to fight the battle themselves. Now, David, verse 12, was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. Whoa. Verse 13. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And we know the names of the sons. We just saw them in the last chapter. They're uh, Eliab and the firstborn, and then uh, Abinadab and Shema. These were big guys, too. Remember, Saul wanted to pick them to be the king of Israel, remember? So they're, they're big dudes. 
again, Saul setting a big army, big army of big guys. It, always, always about the outward, isn't it? Always about what the resources. Man, we need all the big guys in the front because we got a big guy out there. You know, and, and that's just the resources. That's the way we think. We got to approach the scene with everything we got. But it's funny because that's not God's provision for them. It wasn't none of these men. And David was the youngest. And the three eldest followed Saul. A quick little blurb about David. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Interesting, isn't it? Here we have this whole scene, man. This whole cool army scene. This battle scene. You know, all these pictures of, of, of what it was for them, the Philistines of Israel. All these pictures of how Satan is to us today. All these pictures of what kind of victory Jesus would pay for us. But then we have this really neat picture that sits right in the middle of all this. And it's a picture of the man in the scriptures that say he has a heart after God. It's, it's a picture of a young man who is the anointed king of Israel. I'm so glad we know who it is already. Because we get to see what kind of person he was. We get to see a little bit of what God seen in David. And David at this time, when the world around him was undergoing this, this, this uh, tremendous you know, turmoil, his king, everybody, his family, even, <coughs> even to his family, his, his brothers were in this war. You know, a lot of you guys older lived in a time where you had family members go to war. And, and, and it affects the family big time. And David is, is here living in this time. His brothers are at war. The nation's at war. And we already know that he developed a relationship with Saul because last chapter said, hey, Saul really loved the kid. And, and David is, let's not forget that David is directly intertwined with all this. But where do we see him? We see him with a sheep. He's feeding the sheep. He's, he's doing what God has called him to do at that moment. He's doing his responsibilities. He's being faithful to those little things that were big to him in his life. And God looks at a man like that. And he doesn't say to David, what are you doing, David? You, you shouldn't be out there messing around with those sheep. You see the nation in turmoil. Put ourselves there in this little story real quick. Imagine if the nation that we're in right now was in turmoil like this, and well, and and we're at war, and and our families are being called out, and and you know you're going to get driven to man. I want to go, man. You know what I'm saying? I want to fight for my family. I want to I want to preserve our nation. But but for some reason or another, David has this mindset of just saying, well, I just this is what I'm doing. This is this is the lot that I've been given. This is the area of place in my life that God has called me to maintain. Verse 16, and the Philistines drew near morning and evening and presented himself for 40 days. 40 days. Man, that's a long time. That's, that's 40, 40 days and nights of rain and the flood of the earth. That's 40 days Jesus fasted in the wilderness. 40 days this enemy was there, this, this time of interrogation, this time of, of trial, and this time of, of just ongoing, relentless, annoying enemy ever before. Jesus was there as soon as he was filled with the Holy Spirit. As soon as that dove came upon him, he immediately went out to the wilderness, and there he was tested. For 40 days, Satan's annoying him the whole time. But just as we see, and we'll, just as we've seen Jesus become victorious by the word of God and by the, by the power of God, later in our chapter we see the same. And it says now in verse 17, And Jesse said unto David his son, All right, take now for thy brethren an ephod of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp of thy brethren. And carry these ten cheeses under the captain of their thousand, and look out thy brethren fair, and take their pledge. See, 
Here comes the drawing. This is our next scene. We have the war. We have the enemy present. But now we're going to see God now bringing David into the scene here. Bringing him into God's way of bringing him into the situation. Because we know eventually it had to happen. <laughs> eventually the chosen king of Israel has to get involved in all this. See, but God is going to use David's everyday practical things. Everyday practical uh, daily things. And a part of what his responsibility is at this moment is not only to tend the sheep back at home, but to now he's going to be giving food and, and sustenance to his, his family. That was his, that, that's what his duties were. But the thing about David is he saw, he saw to find his duties pride in them. He saw, you know what, this is what I'm supposed to do. And he did his, his due diligence of what God gave him. There's no other way to emphasize that. David took an important look at what God was calling him to do. His dad says, hey, he's taking orders from his dad. He knew, man, that he, he had in with the king already. What stopped? What didn't? How did, what prevented him from just going, hey, me and Saul are tight pops. I'm going to go over there to the war. I'm going to sit in the tent with the king. Our flesh would totally be drawn to that type of scene. How easy we're drawn to men and how easy we're drawn to power and, and want to be power, leave it that way, and control and how easy we're drawn to just the, you know, having this circle of influence. David could utilize all this already. We already know it. But here he is. His dad's telling him, hey, get cheese ready, man. Cheese. <laughs> okay, there he is. Whipping up cheese however they used to do it for his brothers to go feed them. There he is out there, you know, with the sheep and everything, and he's getting food ready, food prepared, because he knows that this is what his dad wants him to do. There's a lot of integrity in that. There's a lot of integrity when we don't allow for the influences of men to dictate the situations that God has called and put it on our table now. It says a lot about a person who can look at what responsibilities they have, though it looks small in a time where the world is falling apart, but your responsibilities seem like they, have, they can have no real effect on what's going on on the nation. Okay, making cheese couldn't have that much of an effect on what was going on with his nation. Could it? I mean, am I wrong here? You know, uh, getting bread ready couldn't have that much to do with what was going on with his king and his family. Is it? But it did, didn't it? It did. You see, he's being faithful with the little. As the Bible tells us in the New Testament, you're faithful with the little. If God sees us to be faithful with the little things, we can be trusted with more. And so now, he's making this stuff, and now, here we go, verse 19. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up, now, now watch this, and David rose up early in the morning and put on a sword and a shield and grabbed his gun no, it doesn't say that. It says, he left the sheep with the keeper. See, he, he had great concern in detail about what was his, about what God gave to him. Even, even when it's ready, time it's go time. David, it's go time. Okay, hold on. Let me just make sure the sheep are okay. See, this is one picture of Jesus that I... I can rest in always is no matter how the war looks, man, around us, no matter, no matter what's going on with your family, you know, what's going on uh, with some, with health, what's going on with money, what's going on with kids, no matter what's going on with all these things, Jesus ain't going to, he's not going to ignore these things that these are his sheep, we're his sheep, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're, we belong to a shepherd who loves us, who takes care of who, who was concerned, who don't leave, who don't just leave, up and leave. I, I got to go. Jesus saying, like, I got to go do war with, you know, Obama and, you know, the presidents, you know, and the League of Nations in Europe. No, I don't know. Jesus is concerned about every single one of those who he considers to be his. And he doesn't abandon us. No, don't let the enemy ever deceive us into thinking that we have been abandoned by the Lord. And that God doesn't, that Jesus is looking lightly upon your circumstance because he's not looking lightly upon your circumstance, nor is he looking lightly upon your situation and your life. He's not. He looks at your life just as important. He looks at my life just as important. He looks at Obama's life. Just as important. He looks at Pastor Jeff's life. See, he looks at all of us the same. 
He is the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the one who leadeth his sheep to rest. And you read that book, Psalm 23, or whatever it's called, that shepherd's like something, you will see how hard that was for a shepherd to do, to get his sheep to go to sleep by the, they had to be full, they, they, could, they could be thirsty, or else they'd be all weirded out, the sheep wouldn't be able to sleep, they, and he had to find a nice little area for them to lay down, he couldn't just lay, these sheep just couldn't lay on, on sticky ground or thorns or anything, because they, they would be like, I can't sleep. So the shepherd had to spend time to make this happen with the sheep, and that's a picture of Christ. He spends the time with us, if we allow him to. See, we, a lot of us don't trust him in that area yet, do we? A lot of us don't trust that. We, Our lives are busy, man. I'm not going to even say it's not. Our lives are busy. Some of us in here are busy dudes. And not only after this, we got kids running all over the house. Wives who want to talk. Bosses who want to talk. Friends who want to talk. People want to call. People want to text. People want to email. Why'd you text me back, bro? Well, I was, you know, what do you I was driving. You know, you got... It's just, uh, we're so busy. And, and, and we, fail, we fail to see that even though we're so busy, Jesus is still there waiting. Just take that time to see what you got going on in your life. He just, he's not, he's not influenced. Jesus is not influenced by the scenario. Nor is David, our future king. He's not, man, geez, I made the best cheese for these. They're going to love this one. He probably added some more spice too, just because they're at war. Spend time. And I love that picture of Christ. So, he says, And left the sheep with the keeper, finishing verse 20, and took and went, and Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. So here we are. Our future uh, victor is on the scene now. You see, he's the stage is set. God has drawn him out in the most natural way too, wasn't it? He didn't, draw, he didn't draw him out in a suit. It, it wasn't like God led one of them sheep and ran him all the way to the battle and David followed the sheep up to the hills and found the battle and there he was. No, it wasn't a weird thing. God naturally led him into this scene that God has prepared for him. God set this scene for David to be victorious in the end. And he used all these natural things. These everyday, David's everyday occurrences, the things that would cause the flesh to go in turmoil for most of us. We'd be agitated, we'd be anxious, we'd want to get involved. But David just kept focused. See guys, this is the, this is the word for us. To be focused on these things that God has placed before us in our lives today. You're, the scene is set for every single one of us. Our nation is in spiritual turmoil, right? Our churches, and I say this respectfully, are in spiritual turmoil as well. And God has set the scene perfect for us today. We get to do battle not only with the heathen, but we get to do battle with the church too. Because we have such a, a split thing going on in our nation, in our world today. Doctrines unfolding. Uh, churches going to this doctrine and others, you know, even within our own Calvary churches. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor here and I know a lot of what's going on a lot with other Calvary chapels and things. And you got... You got people getting into weird stuff. And, and, and it's happening all around us. Oh, well, I just think the doctrine of election is it's there. Why don't we just go? Come on. Is it really going to fold over the church for that? I mean, there's all these different things people just going, doing battle with. These biblical principles, theological differences, these doctrinal misunderstandings. Something. We're not meant to understand it all, man. <laughs> But now churches will split for the cost of a, a simple thing like understanding. And here we are, God's anointed men with the scene set. What are we going to do? What are we going to set focus to? Your family? I ain't got time to look at my family, man. I got to go do war. What, you know, your, my kids? Am I going to, son, whatever, I, you know, uh, my, <laughs> my sons make sure I don't neglect them, right? I mean, they, they knew I was teaching about it getting into David and Goliath, so they're talking to me tonight. They wanted to see pictures of Goliath on the internet, 
They wanted to see David cut his head off. They wanted, to see, they wanted me to tell them all this stuff before I left tonight. You know, they're like, whoa, 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 so, so wait, wait, how big was his head and all this stuff? And so, but you know, the thing is, is that's where we get to choose, man. We get to choose and say, I can, hey, I can send Easton Jada, not right now, I gotta go. You know, or it, it's, we get to choose. It's all, all for all of us to make these decisions. To say, are we going to focus on those things that God has set right on our plate and invest time into that? Or are we going to allow for the busyness of the war to sidetrack us and get us all consumed? It wasn't like David, nor was that like Jesus. And nor do I want to be that way. And I know every one of doesn't want to be that way. we got to ask the Lord for these things. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. And so, Father, we ask.